All right, so we're having a bit of a bitsy weekend this weekend. So we've uh, we've done our blasting, we've done most of our painting. Uh, Jess, Ryan, and uh, Sydney are all just finishing off the last little bits of painting. So Sydney's doing the the engine vents around the side of the boat. Um, Ryan and Jess are up on the wheelhouse at the moment, and they're finishing the uh, the painting on the, the top coat painting for the wheelhouse. So they're currently doing the first coat of top coat, and then they'll do the second coat tomorrow morning. Um, so that gives me a couple of uh, couple of minutes spare. So what I'm going to get stuck into is an anchor winch beside me. So I'll show you what we've got to do for that. So we obviously need a pretty big anchor winch to lift the anchor on brew peg. So the anchor alone is 110 kg, and then we have 16 mil short link chain. So that's pretty heavy per meter. Um, so one of the things that we use is a big old hydraulic anchor winch. So this is not off brew peg. Um, this is a secondhand winch, and in order we, we we haven't bought this one yet, but in order to determine if we're going to buy it, we need to lift the top off, and then see what sort of condition it is inside. So we know it's hydraulic. It's got a little hydraulic engine. Got the hydraulic controllers up here, but we just need to see what the internal mechanical condition is inside before we go any further with the purchase on this one. So today we're going to rip it apart and uh, yeah, basically do a, a condition check on this winch. So with the move that happened with the boat to do the sandblasting, um, everything had to move, all my tools, like the whole the whole lot, the, everything in the boat and everything outside the boat was basically packed up and then um, unpacked. Um, consequently, I've got about two weeks to look forward to of not knowing where half my tools are. Um, I cannot, for the life of me, find my ring spanners. So I need ring spanners to open these 17 mil bolts all the way around um, the side of the shaft, the main shaft. Um, I don't have it, so I have a ratchet, so I was gonna use that. The ratchet doesn't fit, so. I will have no judgment. I'm going to use a nut pucker. be a bit of paint on the end of the bolt, so once we get through that paint it'll be easy. Nearly there, nearly there, it'll be getting easier and easier now. And I'm sure we're getting close. Still tight? No, okay. Come on! I'll deal with you later. Right, let's go make some chain. So we just pulled the housing off the um, off one side of the main main shaft. So this is the um, the shaft that holds this drum here. This is on our winch, and you can see right in there there's quite a lot of gunk and rubbish in the bearing. So definitely that bearing needs to be replaced. But there's also um, I suppose bigger questions as to why there's so much rust in there. 
So I need to keep stripping it down. So we'll, we'll get this top off now. So we're really stoked with this winch. Um, we were wondering if we were going to buy it, but inside there's nothing that causes any red flags. So we're going to go ahead, purchase it, and we'll strip it down so that we can rebuild it. So while we pack up for the day, Sydney's finishing the last of the painting up on the top sides of Brewpeg. So the winch is stripped down now, um, and there's one issue that we've found. So there's a, there's a brake component on this winch, um, and it's jammed up against the shaft. So we need, or one of the two shafts, so we need to basically get that off. In order to replace the bearings that sit on the top shaft, we need to clear this brake off. Um, normally you just put it into a press and you'd press the shaft straight down and, and you know, two minutes later you'd, you'd be away working and rebuilding your winch. I don't have a press. So, um, the obvious answer, I need to build a press. So this is my um, shaft that I'm trying to pull apart. So this is the bearing that I've got to get free. So there's, there's a housing here that has a rubber seal in it. That comes off. The bearing then slides off this shaft here. There's a wee bit of paint, jam that up. There's a wee bit of paint just around in here that's stopping this from sliding that way. So I'll just pop that seal back up and protect everything. So what I need to get off, this brake component here needs to slide off this shaft. However, on this side of the shaft, there's obviously some burrs and nicks, dirt and so on. Um, what I need to do is basically pull this that way and push that that way. So this is what my little contraption is. So you can see I've got a couple of looped bits of steel, top and bottom, welded in. Um, some beams on either end and then just an old bit of stainless bar that I had lying around. My trusty Toyota Hilux jack. So when I crank this jack up, theoretically it's going to push that that way and this part this way. So that is hopefully going to save me from having to take this to a workshop and getting to strip it down for me. So, crank her up. Crank her up. Done. Brilliant. Right, now I gotta chop this apart to get it off because, oh, maybe not. No, it'll fall off. There it is. Done. All right, let's carry on stripping this down. So let's clean this off. So you can see there's a ring of paint. I can't get the bearing off. I need to get rid of this paint. So you can just use a craft knife. Get it sideways. Won't scratch the shaft. down so these two things are basically seal carriers so um, the one on the, the, this is obviously turned upside down and that's right way up so it gives you an idea what they look like on both sides um, this one here is covered in gunk so if you have a look through here you've got lots of rubbish rust all sorts of greasy junk um, 
I wanted to show you how we clean things. When we used to rebuild engines, we'd sit them in an acid bath and then steam clean them. And if we couldn't get stuff off, if there was still caked on stuff, we'd normally throw them in a tub of either diesel or CRC. Um, some people have it as WD-40, it's a similar product. Um, but CRC is mostly kerosene. Um, diesel is, is very close to kerosene, so um, it's a fantastic cleaner. If you're having trouble getting any sort of gunk off, um, some real hard to get off gunk off parts, chuck it in a, a bucket of diesel. Where are we? Over there, bucket of diesel. Um, and then yeah, you're good to go. Three days later, it'll come off just you know, just like washing it off with water. So I think that would, that one is. Trouble with this bearing, trouble with this bearing is it's completely toast all the way around here. Um, both bearings are in a similar state, they've just completely disintegrated. They were still sealing, partially I suppose, but they were like they were garbage basically, you know. Any waves that came over the deck probably would have got past this and, and into the oil inside. The issue is with this one here. It looks like it's even rusted itself in, so so the edge is just full of like rusty bits of. There's a metal ring in these to hold them stiff, like they're quite quite stiff, you know. So there's a metal ring in there, and I think that metal has actually rusted right away. So what I'm trying to do is hit it away from the surface to get that metal to crumple down and, and disintegrate, so that I can get these seals out. Um, but that's the task. I've got to pull them out without destroying the housing. There we go. So you can see this one's falling apart. Ah, and she's out. Brilliant. But that is pretty rubbish. So you can see this line of ring, like a ring of rust all the way around. So we'll have to clean that up. But that's come out pretty good. I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. I'll be able to get that to work nice. So onto this one. So you can see all the way around here is where the seal sits. You can see there's like a layer of rust up in here and then there's a layer where there isn't a huge amount of rust a little bit further back. That's where the seal sits, hard up against that lip. And then this rust here is where, is on the outside of the winch. So what we need to do is basically get rid of all of this gunky, rusty junk. Because as we push a new seal in, it's gonna catch on all of that and potentially damage the seal. So all of this has to be spotless when we go to assemble it again. So I'm gonna sandblast these just to make sure that they're spot on. We need to do a really good job of cleaning all of this out. There's a real good trick you can use when you're deciding if your um, parts are clean enough is get a white rag and rub it all around the inside and if it comes out not white, um, it's not clean enough. It's as simple as that. Um, when we used to rebuild engines, I used to be an engine reconditioner, um, and when, you, when we used to rebuild engines, we'd just keep cleaning, keep cleaning, keep cleaning until we could put a white rag everywhere and it would come out spotless and then we knew the engine was ready to be assembled. So exactly the same deal for this. I just want to make sure it's spot on inside before we put it together. So, we've sandblasted out all of our surfaces. Our surfaces are all nice and tidy and, and good to go. Now there's a trick to putting in seals. So um, these sort of seals that I'm putting in here are basically the same that you'll have that stop oil coming out of your engine. So um, on the front and back of a crankshaft on an engine, you'll have a virtually identical seal to this. Um, it's they're pretty universal type seals. There's, there's nothing really changes and, and the techniques that I'm gonna use are the same as what every other mechanic in the world will be using to put these sort of seals in. Um, so, the way that there's, there's, okay, so there's a couple of things. You can easily bugger these seals. So if you press, if you just press it in, you're gonna press one side in more than the other because there's no way of avoiding that. And if you do that, you're gonna put this here out of round. So there's a really good chance that it's gonna leak oil and you're never gonna be able to fix that. So because there's like a metal ring that basically sits all the way around the outside edge under this rubber all the way around, there's a metal ring. We wanna use that to evenly press it down. So the way to do that is with a big socket. So you just wanna go around and find whatever socket fits. So the, the OD of the seal is exactly the same or as close as you can get to the socket. In this case, I'm using a 46 millimeter socket, but that's, that's kind of irrelevant because the OD of my socket might be different to your 46 millimeter socket. So you just wanna go through and sit the seal on top of your socket set. And then in this case, find one that matches it perfectly. So 
there's two two sides to it so you've got like an inner side where you can see a spring I'll show you right down in there you can sort of see a spring just underneath this lip here and then you've got an outer which is basically just a it looks kind of blunt sort of a flat face so that's the outside so the flat face goes to the outside so you want to just basically put it in so I've, I've gone through and made sure there's no nicks and garks in this here but you want to basically just sit it in there nice and nice and sort of gentle and even and then you put your socket on top and you can pretty much just press it down nice and firm and then in this case it's a little bit tight so I'm just gonna tap it down even cool so that's done so if you run your finger around this it's basically even all the way around there's no like obvious highs or lows or anything like that because the, obviously the face of this is nice and true and it pushes just pushes it in really well so um, I know that that's not going to leak that's going to be good for you know so long as I don't put any bits of metal or foreign objects in there that's going to be good for years all right time for some bearings so there's four bearings in this winch there's two exactly the same as this these are rusty this was actually seized completely but I left it in diesel for three days and it's freed itself up um, but it's still a pretty knackered bearing. It's grumbly, it's noisy, I don't know if you can hear that sound every time I spin it. Um, it feels horrible, it's like every time I spin it. This is the replacement bearing. Perfectly silent, just beautiful. That's what a bearing should be like. Bearings don't fail in one go, so you can have a brand new bearing and then in let's say, I don't know, three years time it might be worn out and knackered but it's not as if it goes perfect, perfect, perfect dead. It'll start to give you telltale signs, so they'll start to get noisy. So you'll hear that before it starts to fail. Like you could put this bearing back in, it would be okay. It's not definitely not perfect, but it's not as if the winch won't work. Um, and it's not gonna start, you know, I could bash that with a hammer and it probably won't fall apart because these are made really well, but the wear surfaces are starting to get stuffed and that's why that noise is happening. The reason I'm telling you this these bearings are $110 each. So I replaced two of them because in Australia that's pretty good value for a bearing. I was expecting more than that. Um, but yeah, $110 for, for two of these. So we're putting new new bearings in that part of the, of the winch. The other two bearings, so there's four bearings in total. The other two bearings, um, these guys here, $360 each. Um, and they're a real bizarre bearing. So they're, in Australia, they're an imperial bearing, which is a difficult um, bearing to get in Australia. Um, the particular size, the OD and the ID, is a really weird size. Um, and they also take side loads. So these are, these are actually thrust bearings as well. So all of those things, basically every time you tick one of those boxes, you start adding more to the price. So we're gonna try and recondition these bearings. So they are definitely, definitely not in great condition. However, um, when you clean a bearing out, so these have been completely um, stripped down in the diesel and then they've been water blasted within an inch of their lives. So there's absolutely nothing in here to lubricate them. So they sound as bad as they're ever gonna sound in their life. In fact, they sound worse than they actually are. Um, <laughs> yeah. God. They're definitely not great. If I had my option, I would be replacing these. However, they're just so expensive. We're gonna we're gonna run with these, and then if I'm one of my thoughts is actually machining the shaft and the bearing housing and putting in a cheaper but metric bearing, because um, then I could probably get a bearing for a hundred bucks or something like that. However, it's gonna take a couple of hundred bucks of machining to get that done. So, given that I might replace these once in the entire I don't know decade or two that I own Brewpeg, I'm really not stressed about this because. It's one of those things, if this was a wheel bearing, it might last six months and then it would then it would catastrophically fail. However, um, because you know, because you're driving on it every single day. However, because this is an anchor winch, it gets used for about five minutes once a month. So it's probably gonna last me five or six years before it even, you know, before I even really hear it. So what I'm gonna do is rebuild these by cleaning them out and then repacking them. All right, there's an effective and gross way to rebuild, to, uh, to grease up wheel bearings. Take a dollop of grease in your hand like that and you start mashing it in like that. This is a particularly gross job but if 
you're rebuilding trailer bearings or something like that, this is how you pack them. So you can see I'm like mashing it in as I go, sort of jamming as much in that groove as possible. Yeah, that's probably gone down about 70 percent in terms of its noise so our once disgusting bearings have been repacked and they now run really beautifully well that's subjective there's not a lot of noise i'm pretty happy with that considering i just saved myself 700 dollars by doing that um, that's one of the reasons why you'll look at rebuilding bearings in this case right so bearings done now I want to talk about shaft seals so you can see here and here I'll clean that up a bit put in the light right there and right there are two sort of shiny surfaces that's basically where this the inside of these seals here run so these seals slide over top of the shaft like that and they sit about there so that one perfect but will absolutely do the job so this shaft used to be rusty as well um, and again I just threw it in diesel for a few days and water blasted it and it's come up absolutely perfect I've gone through and checked it there's no nicks or burrs I'm really happy there's a couple of little spots of like surface rust but three minutes of using the winch and that's not going to be an issue yeah that's perfect I'm really happy with that so that's that one shaft basically ready to assemble um, I'm going to put that aside now, I'll put it upstairs in a clean area and uh, so we don't just get any dirt and rubbish and so on on it before we assemble it um, and we'll start working on some of the other shafts. Alright, so you can see that dark area on that, so this is 40, 400 grit emery tape, you can see that dark area, that's a bit of diesel. So what I want to do now is polish this area of the shaft, this is where the bearings, the seals and uh, these little spaces sit. So again, I'd love to have this in a lathe so that it was spinning while I'm doing this. But if you can't put it in a lathe, then what I'm doing on a bench here is, is quite okay. So these shafts are hardened steel, or normally they're hardened steel. Um, so they're really tough. Um, and they can take a real hiding, you know, a lot of abuse can happen to these shafts. You can put a lot of gunk through your oil and stuff like that. So if you don't change your oil on your car, this is the sort of thing that basically cops the abuse. So you can put quite a bit of pressure in. I'm basically pulling as hard as I can on this without the whole thing rolling off the end of the bench. So don't be shy, get stuck in. You don't want to really use anything less than a 400 grit. Ideally, I'd probably even go a bit higher, maybe like a 600 or a 800, something like that. Um, but I don't have any tape that fine. So while we're here, there's a few barnacles and rubbish at this end of the shaft. So, got the opportunity to clean it. We're going to get so much innuendo comments. Maybe. What's going on with this Australian couple? Polishing their shaft out in the open. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so, this is grubby and hasn't been cleaned and is a mess. But there's a few things. So this this here is your ceiling surface. So basically that surface mates onto the, the opposite and equivalent on the main case. 
So what you got to make sure is that this can bed down nice and flat. So this is a, this is either cast steel or cast iron, this whole thing, and they machine that flat in, the, in a surface um, surface grinder that basically just machines that perfectly flat. What you got to do is when you pull things apart, it's really easy to nick and bump and dent them and stuff. So an easy trick, just go through with a file and hold it perfectly flat. You're not taking any material off, you're just basically finding if there's any high or low spots. So when we used to rebuild engines, we'd do this to blocks, or not necessarily cylinder heads, because most of them are aluminium, but definitely anything cast iron, you'd, you'd run this around to make sure the edges are, are clean and true. Okay, so in this case, the paint actually sticks up a bit higher than the surface. So we can't have that, we've got to get rid of that paint. So just come along and cut the paint down on an angle and that makes sure that it's not gonna interfere. And then these are your bearing surfaces. This is where your, your main bearing sort of sit. And often you'll get nicks in these edges as well. So we used to chamfer the edges like that. Same deal on an engine, do your big ends and your con rods the same. Don't ever hit this with your file. But you can chamfer that like that. And then I used to like to, because I press the file down, there's always going to be a little burr on the edge, so I, I used to be pedantic and like to do that and get rid of the downward burr. Just just to be anally retentive. So that theoretically, there should be nothing that'll bind up when you put those in. Right. So now we've got to get rid of all the old blue gunk. This blue stuff here is the equivalent of this um, gasket sealant. Um, it's basically like a silicone based thing. So, I'm just going to go that way around. Okay, so I've seen a bit of a, a tent up on the foredeck of the boat because it's so blooming hot. Um, what we're going to do, time to assemble. Right, so I've taken the, the rear bearing out so that I can get this through, basically. So this um, this bearing housing, uh, sorry, the seal housing for the front has this great big lip on it. Um, basically, by bolting this up, it's going to push the bearing in where I need it. So I'm not gonna bother trying to manually get it to align, I'm just gonna actually push it in with this. So, that means the seal's going on. So when you put a seal on, never put them on dry. So just get a little bit of grease or assembly lube or something like a little bit of oil even. You can use oil. Um, you just want to run it around the edge. So you're just filling up. I'll come and show you. <laughs> So right up in this edge here, you're just filling up with grease the whole way around. And basically the job of that is when you slide the seal on, um, the rubber is never going to be dry on that shaft. Um, and I also like to just put a smearing of grease or something around the shaft itself, so it just helps the seal go on. It's like trying to put a wedding ring on with no dishwashing liquid, or take one off with no dishwashing liquid. Same theory. So, just got to get that seal on nice and true, like that, there we go, and it'll go on easily, just need to align that up, that's about right there. So again, the, the outside diameter of this surface here, and the inside diameter of this surface, they're a very slight interference fit, so they're, they're tight to get in. 
Um. What I found out with the other seal, so this is the housing that I'm going to be pushing, bulking up against it, and see how it's got this big lip. That lip fits inside this casing and pushes that bearing in. Hmm. So it basically, um, this this bearing and and the one at the other end are designed to take a load going forward and back. So when I'm winching it, say up, the load might be going this way, and when I'm winching it back, the load will be going this way. These bearings are what's called thrust bearings. Um, they're designed to take a load um, parallel with the shaft, as opposed to just like supporting a load up and down like a roller bearing might do or something. Um, and these these big housings here basically take that load. So that, that forward and back load is transferred into this housing, which is held on by these bolts clamped up against this surface here, and that takes all of the, the load of having to pull the anchor up and down. So if the anchor weighs, if the anchor and chain weighs 300 kgs, this here, and this is say a 10 to 1 reduction, this will be taking 30 kgs of load. So that's our worm screw fitted. Um, so it's in there. You can hear those sort of noisy bearings that we talked about earlier. Um, it spins okay, like it's not perfect. There's a, a tight spot there, um, but uh, that's just basically the bearings. There's not. Does much it go right around though? If there's a tight spot, does it go all the way around? It will, but I can't. My hands are greasy, so I can't turn. Oh, there we go. I think I've got it right there. Yeah. So inside our gearbox housing, you've got this like little tray of. Basically it's an oil collection tray, so oil that's flicking around runs down the roof and the walls and stuff and goes into this little tray all the way around. And there's a hole drilled through the sides here on each of these bearings. And what it does is that, that there fills up with oil, runs down the side here and then puts oil into these side bearings. So they're constantly lubricated. Um, whenever this machine is running, it's constantly lubricating these side bearings at the top. And then there's a big, basically notched in machined part here that takes the oil away so it helps the oil drain back down the bottom so it's a constant flow of oil throughout this machine without the need of an oil pump basically uses the big wheel as like a, a paddle wheel almost um, so we're going to put the wheel in now um, which is called the gear what is it gear worm gear so worm screw worm gear so we're going to put the worm gear back in and then we're going to put in um, it's like a little wee metal tray that goes in here that helps that um, oil collection reservoir to work Right, so time for our main gear. So that there is sitting where it should. Theoretically, help. There. Whoa! So that's what's called the reduction gear. So you can see that it's wonderful. moving very slowly. Wow, so that's amazing. This is, a re this is what's known as a reduction gearbox. So for every one turn of this, this only might do a 40th of a turn. Or the easiest way to think of it is for every, for example, for every 40 turn, for every one turn this makes, this will make, this shaft down here will make 40 turns. Mm. So it means that you have um, 40 times less strain on the motor than what you would if it was like a one to one ratio, if the motor was directly connected to the anchor chain. Yeah, so that's how you can make a winch really powerful. Currently racing around like crazy people. Because that, where is it? Big mongrel black thing is approaching. So, don't know what the wind's gonna get to. It's supposed to spike, so, let's see what we get. View from the wheelhouse. So, it's um, bucketing down. So, this is. Um, Holy shit! That's kind of stomping through. It didn't seem like much in the wheelhouse. It kind of just seemed.
when I assemble the the chain gypsy, basically you have this little key here. So in the shaft, you've got this slot machined in here. And the key just sits, literally just sits straight in it like that. And what it does is it acts like when when this is surrounded by this piece here, you can see there's a slot cut out of it to allow for it, allow for that little um, key to sip up in it. So it physically stops this here from be, this uh, this drum here from being able to twist on this shaft. So and then inside there, you see there's a little Allen key. So we get the sun into it. There's a little Allen key right down in there that you lock up, and you can see that it's fit up on that teeth on that key, that little circle, that's where the Allen key bites in. There's another one on the side of this thing here. So there's top one and then there's one on the side as well. And you can see the mark where it's hit there as well previously. So this beast of a thing. Now this is the thing we had to press off. It's too tight. So I don't know how easily it's gonna go on. I think I'm seeing it an inkling of that. So which is, so th I, this is like a bit of Bakelite. Um, probably in the old days they would have used asbestos, I guess, but basically this is just like a wear plate. And it goes on here. So if you have a look at this, the surface here is basically flat. It's slightly concave, but essentially it's flat. Um, you put that on there like that. And then this is the chain gypsy. So this is for 16 millimeter chain. So it's just a big piece of bronze, um, something or other. And you can see in there, there's no keyway or anything. Like it's a complete, um, just a, just a machine, um, like a recess in there basically. And you can also see that at some point they've machined it out. See how there's a lip all the way around there? Mm -hmm. At some point they've machined this out and they put another insert in there, machined it to the right diameter. So this is obviously worn out at some time. Mm -hmm. They machined it out and then made it like a, a fill-in, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. What's it made out of? I think it's like a bronze. Yeah. Similar to what a propeller would be. It's a lovely metal. Yeah. So this has got a spin, so and it's quite it'll be loose. Mm -hmm. So do you have like a thing on the at the side to uh, stop the it? answer is yes I will. Oh. Currently no I don't. <laughs> um yeah so second hand is eh? Yeah, so I don't know what thread it is yet, I've got to get it made. Yeah, that's but, good. Um so yeah, lots of lots of goop on there. Um and then that on like that so it should be nice and loose yep just like that okay. and then what I need to make and buy so there's gonna be another one of these wear plates on this side and then I have to have a big like a big uh, nut with some um, handles on the end that I'll have to weld up and that that will clamp up against a plate of probably I'll probably make it out of stainless or something, something like that so I don't have to worry about rust um, and the nut wearing on it and rubbing the paint off but basically it sandwiches this here between two essentially two brakes mm -hmm. so so if the hydraulics fail if the engine because the the main engine drives the hydraulics that drive this um winch so if everything fails if the, if the main engine fails if the hydraulics fail in any way like there's just no physical way of being able to use this winch I can run up the foredeck and undo this and the chain will just start free spinning like that and I can put the anchor down Right, okay. Yeah. Oh nice, okay. So Good. it's like a it's like a last minute backup yeah. sort of thing. Nice. And that's partly why you can see here, if you look at these threads, if you see closely how they're all angled off to the end here. Yeah, I was there's, wondering there's been that. a lot of tension pulling in that direction. Yeah. Um and if you look up here, see how they're sort of worn like kind of flat yeah. on the tops? That's because there's been basically one of these discs sitting over here, sort of acting like the brake. So these do wear out and these do get stuffed after a while. Right. Um, yeah. So eventually, like worst case scenario, if you wanted this winch to last another 50 years, you'd probably replace this whole shaft. Right. Um, 
but you know, it's gonna do brew peak fine for a decade or two. Okay. So there we have it. So Anchorage. there we have it. Yeah. Leave it all behind The river's gonna cry when you're gone